Hello there once again everyone. As you can see, Faros is back here into the Harvest Valley in order to start a little bit more progression with the whole playthrough. As you can see, my souls are a little bit higher than they were last time. That's because I spent some time in the Doors of Faros hosting some Rat Covenant PvP. It was really fun. A lot of really good duels and hopefully I can get that edited and released in short order though. It's going to be a learning experience, so any sorts of feedback or criticisms you can give would be much appreciated. Crap. I honestly thought that wasn't going to kill him. It would seem I was wrong, but I can come back and try again right after I come down here. So, shouldn't be too much of an issue. I like to get him down to a sliver of health before he actually opens the... A uh, little side area back there, just so I can immediately kill him once it's open to me. But, as you can see, that kind of backfired a little bit. So, we're going to have to try that again after I tag the bonfire. <coughs> there we go. Come on back. It's, it is a cool mechanic. I like the idea that you have to manipulate the enemy to sort of open the way for you. So, I am kind of happy with how this encounter is put together. I just don't like how difficult it is to get him to face the right way and get it done for you. It can take a while to manipulate him, especially because he walks backwards before unleashing his ranged attack. That should get it. There we go. See? Three hits shouldn't kill him, but apparently it did, so... That'll teach me to two-hand this thing bunch of lovely stuff. The Old Knight Great Shield and Pike. Again, the, the Old Knight Great Shield leads to some very interesting questions about the relationship between the sunken city of Sholva and the sinking city of Hyde, but there's nothing final about any of it, so I don't really know where to go with that line of speculation. You can get all these guys in a lovely little line here that makes it very easy to deal with them unless you're being silly and forgetting your range then you start taking hits Oh, normally he would be locked up in that animation for much longer but the fall actually broke it so he got to completely reset mm -hmm. not even the backstab let's see what the backstab does to these guys Whew. that's pretty okay not the best, but I'll take it. Green Blossom. Always nice to have more of. There's a bunch of little bits of loot all around the area that I like to pick up, but none of it's too terribly important. It's just some nice things to have. Do I get anything good? No, just rotting pine resin. Kind of sad, but still a pretty good item. Especially if I'm going to be trying to cheese an enemy with poison. Can be pretty useful. Stand up for me. There we go. Now I can hit you. Kill your buddy as well. Leads right into a little cache of items. This guy can always come up behind you and catch you out if you're not paying attention for him. But that's everything here, and the last little bit is just the jumping attack for the crystal lizard over here. did not work. That's the input for you. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. This time they were not so willing to give it to me. Drop on down. Immediately come over here and even more spice and some large titanite with a soul over here. You can just heal up. Oh, it's a human effigy. My apologies. You can heal through the poison fairly easily, so it's nothing to make too big of a deal about. Catch him out. Lock him down. Heal up so that the poison doesn't kill me, because that would be embarrassing. And now I can finish this off with relative ease. Oh, that's nice. I was expecting that to be a two-hit kill. Grab Chameleon over there, and that's all for the poison of this area. I can just be done completely. I did skip out on a fading soul down one of the drops over in the main chamber, but that's not worth it anyways. 
It's just kind of there to tempt you into the poison. I wonder if I can kill these guys with a jumping attack. I think I could. But I'm not entirely sure. Let's see what that does for me. That's what I like to see. Anytime you can one-shot somebody, it's the ideal situation. The other great thing is that most of my weapons take forever to break because of how massive they are. Yeah, that's what I thought backstabs would do. Seems I didn't get the full ticks on the other guys. I'll always stop in here to at least learn the gesture, even though I'm not going to be joining the Covenant. It always weirds me out seeing this many uh, bloodstains, because honestly, there's there's really no reason to die there. There's only one of those enhanced undead, and they're really not a threat. Come down here. I want to get this guy first. Oh, ow. The inputs are really screwing me over today. Oh, and that's not a kill shot? Really? This is all bad. Let's get him out of the way so I can just deal with you. They do stagger fairly easily, so that is my little saving grace there. Might have to use some of the life gems, which would be really silly, given that this area is usually one of the easiest in the game. Even the boss is ridiculously easy to deal with. You want to snack on that poison moss after you're already heading back from grabbing the SS shard, because otherwise there's a chance that you'll get poisoned again on your way back which would really suck if you already wasted a poison moss. You can just hack and slash right through. The great axe is apparently not the best for this area just because it doesn't give me any more of a chance to kill them in one hit than the bastard sword except for certain jumping attacks so it's really not worth the extra stamina cost and slightly slower swing time. Get a little bit more spice back here. And now I can head down and clear that bottom area. Always use a rolling, a uh, sprinting drop rather than a jump or anything because too often you'll mess yourself up and actually overshoot the landing, which can be very sad. Oh, really? That's not even a one shot. Goodness. That's really sad. I was expecting a little bit more out of this, but... Oh well. It still has a bunch of poise damage. It still gets the job done. It's just a matter of using it properly and in the right circumstances. Not to mention that the backstabs with this thing are absolutely horrendous. Really great. Just three more... Of those beetles and one more hammer hollow and we'll be ready to face the boss. I'm gonna two-hand this for the powerful one-shot swinging attacks versus the little group right here. Hmm. Maybe that was unnecessary. But no matter. Still allows me to kill everything nice and easy. This little thing is a trap but it's very easy to avoid, so I trigger it anyways. It is just a torch, but I want it. Even if something's useless I, and it's loot, I almost always still want it. <coughs> there we go. Covetous Demon over here. One of the contenders for easiest boss in the game. Incredibly, uh, incredibly uh, easy telegraphed moves and so long as you're not getting greedy it's very easy to just circle around the only problem is that it's incredibly easy to get greedy because of how horrible of a boss it is it's kind of a little bit of a paradox in that the most difficult part about it is that it's so easy it's fairly often underestimated I would say it has a problem with that because it's so easy that it lures you into a false sense of security and you feel like you can do whatever, but I have enough Estus to clear through it with no problem. Let's head back to Majula and spend some of these souls and 
earth and peak is open before me. I don't believe I have enough chunks yet. Uh, yeah, I only have two chunks. I'm going to need one more before I can upgrade my bastard sword to plus ten, but it's right on the road, so we'll be getting there soon enough. Hmm. I could increase my vitality, but I don't think I'm going to just yet. I might want to stick with the Ring of Blades, so let's try and get my agility all the way up to 100 before I start doing anything else. Back on over to the Earthen Peak. And now we'll have sort of a chance to use some of the throwing knives that we've been stockpiling. They're extremely useful later on in the level for either knocking enemies backwards into poison pots or just killing them from range so that you can make a jump unmolested. The counter hit will kill those guys in one shot. I knew that was going to work, so that's why I went for that, even though it didn't necessarily work earlier. How many radiant life gems do I have? Only 15? I was expecting that to be actually a little bit more, but apparently not. Yeah, the stagger on great weapons like this is just so beautiful. I think it's like one of the most important reasons why you should use a great weapon like a great axe. Just because you can keep things stagger locked so easily. It's basically a guarantee, to be honest. I want to use the vertical swing here so that I can hit him even though we're in the hallway, but it works out fairly nicely. The tricky part is trying to get them to shoot their arrows before you open the chest, backing off so that you don't get shot, and then coming back to grab it. Otherwise, since they're shooting poison arrows, if they manage to snag you while you're in the middle of opening the chest, it, it's actually very easy to find yourself stunlocked into being poisoned. Only one more of these guys before the next bonfire, and he will quickly learn that he is not enough to face a bastard sword plus eight. Just is not in the cards for him. And now I get my bonfire with the torch that I'm going to need to put out the whole windmill mechanic. Get rid of the poison in the area. I still don't agree with how obscure that is, especially because in my first playthrough I actually had to that was one of the few things I had to look up just because I knew there was some way to get rid of the poison and I thought it might have something to do with the windmill but the terrain that actually leads to the windmill looks like impassable terrain the little broken bits and so I was really just at a loss because I quote knew that I couldn't head to the base of the uh, windmill in order to set it on fire and I tried hitting it from the bottom top and middle with fire bombs and torches and there was just no way that I could hit it it wouldn't work and honestly if you're gonna have something like a burning the windmill mechanic then I, I really think that it shouldn't be scripted to just one sim single place I think that if you hit it with fire it should go up it, you shouldn't have to light the base, the, the metal base, I might add, of the windmill on fire, the little spindle it turns around, because, honestly, how, do, how does that even work? It, make, it would make much more sense if you just threw something at the cloth and wood construction of the thing out in the middle, but they don't really work that way, I guess. Logic is not necessarily the most important thing in a Souls game. Just so long as you get the player to the end goal, no matter how it happens, it's it works. So I'll accept it just because that's what we're given, but I still don't agree with it. Come on back through here, because I want to grab the item out from under the platform as well. It's kind of annoying that you have to go through here multiple times, but... That's how the game works. I'm not going to bother grabbing the Lightning Spear Miracle that's found B 
below the mid-level, just because it's completely worthless on this character. I don't intend to be casting any sorts of miracles, only certain hexes and pyromancies, so I could just leave that completely off the list. Stand up, get knocked down. Not to mention the faith nurse have made gathering the, uh, oh, that's not ideal. Get his aggro, and now I can take him out. But the faith nerfs have made collecting the miracles rather worthless. Oh. <laughs> Didn't want to waste that, but oh well. Forgot to switch on over to the Estus. Avoid this here trap. Now I can loot the room in relative peace. He might still chuck another poison throwing dagger at me, but he doesn't, so that's nice. A pair of dragon charms for my trouble. Not the best loot, but it's passable. This girl over here you want to take out from range, so. Do I have my bow equipped? I do. Let's see. Yeah, I was going to use throwing knives, but apparently I've got my bow equipped, so that's not going to be necessary. Another radiant life gem for all you people out there collecting them. They are really useful, but they they feel almost too useful. They're like one of those items that I never find myself using just because of how good they are. Just like elixirs in Final Fantasy, radiant life gems and old radiant life gems especially are just items that I almost never use, especially because they're almost completely worthless in New Game, and I rarely head on to New Game Plus cycles. It's just not my favorite style of play. I'd much rather create a new character and play through the base game like that than head on to New Game Plus and face the same thing again with wonky phantoms placed everywhere and with a uh, increased health bar and taking more damage. It just isn't how I would like to play the game. Oh, that didn't work at all, really. Oh well. I have recently learned that if you come at those and roll just directly through them, you can actually avoid the poison. It's really weird because most of the times if you roll through a poison pot, you get drenched in poison. But with those two, if you just man up and head right on through, you get nothing. So, it's actually quite nice. I have my fire bombs equipped. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Turn back. Oh, you too. I'll serve you. Oh, really? I didn't kill it. It looked like it was dead. No such luck, apparently. This is the other place where throwing knives would come in handy. And I think I'm going to use them just because it's quicker than pulling out my bow. All you have to do is pop off two quick shots and the poison jars take care of the rest. Oh, nice drops. Lovely. Lovely. Uh, spell restoration and a dragon charm again. I almost never ever use dragon charms just because they take so long. Monastery charms I do use because... Oh, I'm almost glad that my swing didn't carry me into her. Again, monastery charms I do occasionally use because in the early game, there are points where you want to be getting the heal and the poison restoration. So they come in kind of handy, but the dragon charms are so late in the game that it almost never comes up. Tag both of these secret walls, and I get my petrified something and my bonfire to head on through. And I can also take on those two Grave Wardens down there, one at a time. What exactly Grave Wardens are doing in Earthen Peak with the Sorceresses of Jugo? Mm. Lore is kind of not very helpful for this. It's, it's a very strange situation that has no explanation that I've been made aware of, at least. It doesn't make sense from what we know of the enemy types and the location, so you really just have to take it with a bit of a grain of salt. It happens occasionally, a little bit more often than I'd like here in Dark Souls 2, but it's not terrible. It's nowhere near as bad as some would have you believe. I know there's a lot of really cynical uh, sentiment 
in the community around Dark Souls 2 and the lore, but it's really a lot better than most people make it out, and it kind of gets me down when people start hating on the lore so terribly, especially because I've spent a lot of time with it, and I've actually figured out that it, for the most part, works really well. Dark Souls 1 had a bunch of uh, sort of strange points and things that didn't fit together too, and people just tend to ignore that because of nostalgia reasons, and it really hurts the credibility of the personalities in question. Urgeimer and Spy is really bad at that. Like, his most recent videos, he's putting out his run of, uh, whatchamacallit, the Iron King DLC, and it's clear that he just really doesn't care for Dark Souls 2. It's, it's, he's having problems with things like tracking and enemies that he's running into. It's just kind of sad to see because it, it's very clearly coming from a place of bias against the game rather than a problem with the actual uh, DLC or the mechanics they're in. And so it just kind of makes me sad because he makes really great content. It's just that... Eh, He's kind of losing a little bit of credibility, in my opinion, just because he's getting hung up on very little things that he's... Oh, <laughs> I was wondering why that gave me so few souls. I didn't have my Covetous Silver Servant Ring equipped. Let's fix this. The poison damage is not worthwhile when I'm not running any sort of build according to that, and so I'd just much rather have a little bit of extra physical damage. Come to think of it, I probably don't need that little bit of extra physical damage, so let's go with the Royal Soldier Ring. That's the best ring I can see to substitute, just because all the others are kind of bland and wouldn't really help. The Stone Ring's kind of worthless because I have so much poise damage on my weapons already, it's never going to come into play. Otherwise, I think that would be a nice substitute for the Ring of Blades, just because I don't need that bit of damage, but at the same time, because I'm using these big weapons, I don't need that little bit of poise either, so... It's kind of just going to fall by the wayside, and I'm just going to try and get as much stamina regen as possible. Because that is the one issue with these massive weapons, is that they do take a lot of uh, weight, and so if you're not running a very high vitality build, then you will have problems with stamina regen. That's why I made sure to stick with the light armor, because that kind of mm, doesn't quite negate the heavy weapons, but it allows you to meet them in the middle and still get around 50 to 60 uh, weight percentages rather than a full like 70 or even 80 which would actually screw over my rolls as well so I'm really glad that's not the case Magerald here really wish I could have had him earlier to get a line great axe on this character rather than having to trade one over but no such luck I can ignore the curse bite ring just because uh, there's a better anti-curse set up in the DLC now. Um, what did I want to change? Yeah. Get the Jester's Gloves. The Jester's Gloves are, quite honestly, one of the best pieces of equipment in the entire game. I feel they work well with a ton of different armor sets for Fashion Souls, and they have decent defenses with 10% bonus to Souls gained, which is just... A, where did... Where did he come from? Did he aggro from up top there? I, I didn't think I'd aggroed him, but apparently. As I was saying, the Jester's Gloves have that 10% bonus to, uh, to find chance, which stacks on top of what you already have. So you, you really get a ton of extra souls if you're wearing that along with either other pieces of soul finding gear or just the covetous silver serpent ring. So, at this point, I'm getting 132% souls rather than the base 100, which is just so much. It's not necessary, per se, but 
I really like it because it allows me to have a bit of a faster progression and I don't necessarily have anything that I need soul memory for so having that jacked right on up isn't going to hurt me too bad especially because I already have the two big weapons that I'm going to be using while I'm doing the PvP if I was planning on getting a much later weapon for use in PvP then I might want to reconsider because it would kind of boost my soul memory a bit further than I'd want but that isn't the case any sorts of late game weapons that I'm gonna want and I am gonna want some are probably just gonna be for the PvE section of the playthrough rather than any rat invasions I am considering going into new game plus in order to get more rat invasions once I've finished the base game but I haven't quite decided yet because Honestly, rat invasions are pretty hard to come by no matter where you are in the game. And I don't know if New Game Plus would actually help any. Get some nice twinkling Titanite. I could swamp out for the life ring, but I've never raided the life ring and probably never will. It's just not a very good ring in my opinion. Come on. Take this guy out. It's nice to see that I can get them one-handed, but... Neither of the weapons I have are very good for predictive hits, especially versus these really quick thrusting Alon Knights, so quite often I'm going to find myself trading rather than getting a nice clean hit off. It's sad to say, but it's how the character kind of works for now at least. He's going to fall down to his death, and I'm just going to run straight on by. This is my usual path, and it works really well for clearing the area. The bridge actually blocks your back from the one Alon Knight behind you, and you can immediately drop down and tag this lever if, if fate smiles upon you, because depending upon how long you took with the other sections, they can actually be timed a certain way that they will hit you anyways. Always pause a moment before you head up the last little bit of this ladder because I've had it happen on several characters that even though I had triggered the uh, smelter, the little furnace there to turn off, it had yet to actually stop spewing fa flames. And so quite often I would find myself rising up on this ladder, getting to the top and going out, and then just being cooked alive by a a spurt of flames coming from absolutely nowhere. It was very confusing and very, very frustrating. And for the longest time, I didn't know how to deal with it. And at this point, I've just kind of accepted that it's a bug and made sure to check whenever I head through there. Come on across. And you always want to make sure to take out this guy before you head across the bridge. I mean, head across the jump back there. Oh. That stagger animation looked like his death animation, so I got a little bit confused. But uh, Right here, because if he shoots you at the proper timing, he can either knock you into the gap right there, or stagger you mid-jump, leading you to fall directly into the puddle there, which is very, very sad to see. I could actually use the Zweihander. It's a decent Ultra Great Sword, but I don't really think it's for this character. I'm go I'd much rather have something a little bit more quality and maybe just a little bit more useful because the Zweihander, while it's really nice and iconic, it's not necessarily the most utilitarian greatsword ever. I'm actually just going to completely unequip my bow and uh, great axe because I want as much roll distance here as possible and I can just use poison throwing knives for the actual stagger. Not the stagger, but the poison proc whenever he buffs. So I really don't want to have any extra equipment that I'm not going to be using. This should get him buffing as soon as he's done with this. Yep. Probably going to get two off here. Maybe three. Now I can start hitting him again. Ow roll through it. Is he gonna buff? Yep. Get my last two off and he's poisoned. Oh, I didn't even need five. It only took four. There we go. Oh, I rolled that. Come on, come on. 
Oh, that could have been very, very dangerous for me. I could have swore I rolled that, but the game disagrees with me, so I take the damage. There we go. One more combo like that should finish this off. But I don't have the stamina for it. Back it off. Make sure I don't get popped. And now I kill him. Beautiful. And this is actually going to get me access to the Ring of Blades plus one. Which is actually probably going to be more useful than the little bit of weight that I would get from the Royal Soldier Ring. So I'm going to swap that back in. It's not necessarily going to come in handy immediately, but it's still nice to have. Tag that bonfire. I'm actually going to swap my load up just a bit. Bring in the Great Axe. And I am going to want to have the Craftsman Hammer equipped for the uh, Ironclads once I finish up with Smelter here. Where is it? There it is, Varangian Shield. Because Smelter, I mean, not Smelter, but the Ironclads right over there are just as weak to blunt damage as the Hide Knights, and so even at base stats to wield it, you can still get a uh, two-hit kill on them if you're using the Craftsman Hammer. It's one of the reasons it's so useful. It's just it allows you to take on any of the really blunt, weak enemies no matter what. It's very easy. Get the parries off because it's nice to just get some free hits. Oh, and a stagger too. Lovely. However, he came out of the stagger with a hit that I was not expecting, and I took it on the chin, so let's heal that back up. As you can see, parrying is extremely effective against the pursuer. Most other bosses, they recover far too fast for parrying to be useful, but if you can get the timing down, then the pursuer is not one of those bosses and you can just wail away on him in all the meantime. Grab his item, toss that on, and I am ready to continue. My bow isn't going to come in handy versus any of the enemies coming up unless I really want to cheese them with the poison effect, so since I don't want to do that, I'm just going to head right on through without re-equipping it. I could head back to Majula and spend these souls just to be safe with them, but uh, this next area isn't very threatening to me, so I don't like to waste the time. As you can see, these Elan Captains are also really easy to take on with parrying, if you're using a small shield or a buckler or something like that, so keep that in mind. You can see that it's, this is still a base Craftsman Hammer, and I'm still just wrecking them. You immediately run past, because even if you're not in range for the Ironclad to get a predictive hit, it's going to start pummeling the little bit of the bridge right there, so you already want to just get as far away as possible. Open that up for a little bit of safety. Probably would have been better to uh, trigger the bridge first so that the Elan Knight went down along with the pair of ironclads, but it's a little bit late for that now. So instead, I'm going to come up here and activate this whole rigmarole. Of course, I've got to get my little lightning ring over here. It's not worthwhile, but I want it anyways. Tag the bonfire just so I can come back here when I'm ready for it. And head right back on up so I can head right back on down. Hopefully I don't get sniped by the Elan Archer on the way, but it shouldn't be an issue. There we go. Double swig, and I'm back to full. Wonderful. Mm, hopefully it doesn't interrupt me as I come to kill this lizard, but I don't think it will. Chunk. Bam. Be sure to immediately run off so that the archers don't plink away at you, but should be good. Where is it? Did it fall into the lava? I think it may have. But that does give me the second, well, the third chunk I needed, so... As soon as I head back to Majulia, my weapons will become of equal strength. Wait for him to fire so that you can come over here. And you can get a plunging attack. Really fun. Really fun. They don't give you very many of those in this game, but when they do, take advantage of them. Even if they're not necessarily the most 
uh, optimal way of taking on an enemy, they're still really fun and really great feeling. Wait for this, and this is the last of the Alon Knights that are going to be down here, so I can just Estes and head on up the ladder there. So many times when playing on autopilot, I will head right on up this ladder, see a chest, and be like, oh, let's just grab the chest. And as you can see, that would be a terrible idea. This mimic has caught me more times than I would care to admit, just because uh, this the Iron Keep is really kind of an autopilot area for me once I've cleared that first little courtyard. The actual innards of the keep itself are really easy to clear through all in one go, and once I'm in, it's just turn off my brain, clear on through, make everything happen, grab all the loot, and I'm good. This item over here is a Black Knight Great Axe, which I actually could use with my stats, but I honestly think it's one of the worst weapons in the game, even though it is one of the Black Knight weapons. It is nothing like the original, and even then, the original is nothing like the original, because... Uh, the first Black Knight Great Axe was incredibly powerful in Dark Souls 1. And for a while it was just an all-around impeccable weapon. And so FromSoft saw that, and that's one of the few big nerfs that they gave in Dark Souls 1. Whereas here in Dark Souls 2, they kind of just hand out nerfs and buffs like they're candy. They're actually paying a lot more attention to balance, and I'm really happy with that. They've done a lot in order to keep the game sort of middle of the road, make sure there's not necessarily too many OP strategies or uh, items and spells in the game, and they've done a really good job of it. Honestly, they need to buff Faith back up to a more reasonable level, and Katanas are still a little bit out of control with their counter damage, but FromSoft has been paying attention and has done a lot of really great fix fixes as they've uh, sort of watched over Dark Souls 2, whereas Dark Souls 1, there were huge, just massive periods of time where what you saw was what you got. There, there was very little support for Dark Souls 1, and that's one of the... Oh, uh, he gets the predictive hit. Very rarely do they go for that, but it happens. As I was saying, that's one of the things that I really like about Dark Souls 2 over Dark Souls 1, is that it's more than just uh, they released the game and then they were happy with it and let the community sort out its own problems. We've actually received support from the from from software, whereas in the original, they just kind of left us all to our own devices. They didn't even give us a way to run it at 60 FPS. That was the community that actually had to do that for them. It's true that they didn't follow through on the promise of a really dark lighting engine, but I'm actually kind of okay with that. As I've said, I don't like the mechanic of the torch taking away the player's left hand. It doesn't sit right with me. I think there are ways that you can make the player uh, work around certain systems without taking away control of the player character. And I think that's one of the great things about Dark Souls, is that they allow you to control your character as much as you want. Anything you want to do if you have the skill, you can do it. You have, you want to use a certain weapon, put the, put the points into your character and start using it. If you want to clear a certain way, I mean, it's probably a little bit more difficult than the optimal route, but you can do it. You want to wear the most garish set of armor ever? Feel free. You want to do wield friggin' handmaiden ladles and go to town on Drang Lake? You can do that. And if you're good enough, it can be viable and effective. Whereas with Dark Souls 1, it, I mean, with the torch system, yeah, it takes away control of the player character and says, oh, you want to clear through this area? Well, do it this way. Or you want to handle your character in this manner, build it in such a way? Well, too bad. This is what you're going to have to do in this certain area or to deal with this mechanic that we placed into the game that nobody was asking for. A lot of people were hyped for it, but really, who was asking for more darkness after the Tomb of the Giants? I'm pretty sure that was a very clear 
uh, referendum on the fact that nobody likes that mechanic. Ooh, that could have been really nasty. It might be interesting from a game design aspect, but it's certainly not an enjoyable mechanic. As you can see if you've ever played through the gutter. Again, it's a very well designed area, but it's not fun to play. And that's the problem that I have with the whole torch system, is that while it's all well and good to design your game like that, it doesn't fit with in Dark Souls. It doesn't work within the themes and the reasons that I love Dark Souls. It just doesn't fit. It's out of place, and that's one of the reasons that I can't stand the gutter. There's, it just goes against how souls are meant to be made and played. It's supposed to give you the ability to play your character out however you want, and taking away the player's left hand in order to make them use uh, a torch is really a really scummy way of setting that up. It's also another reason why so many people dislike Blight Town and, uh, goodness, the Valley of Defilement and the Shrine of Amana and so many of the, those other locations is because they're nerfing the player. They're taking away your move speed or your rolls or both in some cases. They're making you walk at a certain pace and it, it just feels bad. It's not fun. It's not engaging. It's not a interesting or likable mechanic. I mean, sure, it works from a design aspect. I mean, Dark Blight Town is one of my favorite areas in any of the Dark Souls games. Not the Dark Souls games, but any of the Souls games. And even I can admit that I don't like walking around in the swamp without the Rusted Iron Ring. The Rusted Iron Ring is a great idea. Taking away a character's ring slot, that's acceptable. That's fine. That's why I'm fine with the Covenant of Artorias in order to face the... Uh, Four kings, just for that added difficulty of you only get half your rings. That's that's fine. That's a good way of setting that up. Taking away the player's left hand, like if they actually had to hold up a magical barrier against the abyss, that wouldn't have been okay with me. That would have been poor design. That's something I cannot condone and would not enjoy. That's just... It goes against the core philosophy of how I enjoy the game. It's It really just is diametrically opposed to the way that I imbibe this content. I want to get my agility all the way up to 100 and get some of that vitality up. Now is the time that I've got my 40-40, I've got 100 agility. Now is the time I can start pumping my regular stats all the way up to 20. I'm looking at it and I'm 117 now, which means that I'm going to have just about enough points for 2020 in faith and which int, as well as enough for a little bit of attunement, and I might even be able to squeeze myself into the, uh, oh, prepare the channel list, I didn't. had a lot of fun with that, really glad that dropped for me, but uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be able to squeeze myself into a level 175 build and have it really just set up perfectly for me. Pop the soul so I can upgrade my bastard sword, where are you, there you are. And now my early game weapons are absolutely complete. The only things left for me at this point are going to be late game like boss weapons or twinkling weapons that I'm going to be getting a little bit later on. Clip everything back up now that I've got that little bit of extra carrying capacity. My full setup manages to come in under 50%. That makes me really happy. I'm just going to upgrade my SS flash shards and that's going to be it for the episode. Toss that off on her. Ah, uh, goodness. That's right, I need to uh, get the Creighton event back in the middle of the Shaded Wood, and then I can finally head over to uh, Brightstone Cove and finish up the run there. And from there, it's on to Sholva. Thank you so much for watching. It's been a pleasure as always, and I will see you all next time.